welcome to our next module, Medanae Habu. Now this is the memorial temple, mortuary temple, fashions change, what we call them, of Ramses III. Well, it isn't. There's more to it than that. But you know me, there's always more to it than that. So let's go and see what we can see. So, uh, Medanae Habu, we have the 18th dynasty temple, which was um, started by Hatshepsut and Thutmosis III and usurped by our good friend Ramses II. We have a Ramses III, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Harim conspiracy and the Sea Peoples. And we also have the Chapel of the Gods' Wives of Armen. Uh, do you remember those, from Karnak? Good. Right, let's look at an overview of the temple taken from the hot air balloon, which is quite handy for us. Um, now, do you see what an enormously defensive wall is round the temple? Do you see? Really, really, really thick. And when you're down there on the ground, um, it's actually thick enough to build houses in. Now, this is Ramses III's temple here. We have his temple palace here. We have storage rooms here. We've got the 18th dynasty um, uh, uh, temple here. The chapels are here. The gateway here. And then we have this Ptolemaic area here. So, um, quite a lot. Sit down and get ready. So, this is um, a map of the um, uh, entire area. So there you can see the 18th dynasty temple there. There the God's Wives gateway, the um, Ramses III area, and the Roman court. Now, what we're going to be looking in detail at this wall here, and we're going to be... The temple palace, by the way, is over there. It's not marked on here. So we've got um, a fairly standard a layout here of a pylon, a courtyard, a pylon, a courtyard, a hypostyle hall, and some sanctuaries. Now, this is a fairly common sort of temple layout. Um, most of them look like this. Um, and uh, it, it gets progressively, the floor gets higher, like I talked about in Consul, the roof gets lower. Um, it gets more and more private as you go through. Um, so in the first courtyard, you might have some generals getting awarded golden flies at the windows of appearances. Um, you've got some lower level priests. And then as you get further and further in, until you get to the sanctuary itself, only Pharaoh and the high priest would be allowed in that area. So the God's Wives of Armen. Um, now, th this is, as I mentioned before, a period of time in Thebes when the um, pharaoh down in Memphis was trying to keep control of the Theban area. Now, the first three ladies are from um, the, sorry, the first two ladies are from the 25th dynasty. And then we have uh, the, the last lady is from the 26th. Now, she was sort of muscled in to take over from um, somebody who was already planned. So you, we can see very much that Pharaoh is um, forcing these people to adopt this young um, eldest daughter of his so that he can keep control. Now, these ladies wielded a lot of power. And, and had a bob or two, but we know this because their stewards have the most enormous tombs in the Assasifa area. Um, Pabasa, Ankahor, um, uh, Hawa, these are all stewards of the gods' wives of Armen. And um, they have really massive tombs that really must have cost a lot of money and they're just stewards 
So, you know, the must have been um, a very powerful position. Now, this is their chapels in a nice little row there. And they've got offering tables inside. And they're just in front of the Ramses III um, temple. Now, Ramses III, he was the uh, founder of the 20th dynasty. Um, he um, did a lot of work at Habu and Karnak. His temple is KV-11. Um, and his claim to fame, his main claim to fame, is that he copied Ramses II in everything he did, uh, using his name, calling his sons by the same name, um, because he really, really admired him. He was also, uh, he had a, a number of battles against the sea people. So now, we've talked about battles of Tutmosis and Ramses, you know, so forth. But Ramses three battles were completely different. He was on the back foot. Um, there uh, was uh, this period of time, we're getting towards the end of the Bronze Age, and these sea peoples were causing chaos. Combined with the Libyans, they were destroying empires all over the place. And uh, the old Bronze Age empires, like the Hittites, were disappearing. And so very, very significant that Ramses is fighting a defensive war at this time. And that is why we have this massive wall around this temple. Uh, it's to keep the baddies out. Uh, you know, he, he got people coming in across the desert who were giving him a hard time. And, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of money um, in the temple magazines, you know, gold and incense and oils and so forth. Um, he had to protect it. Um, the other thing is the hiring conspiracy. And, and, and this is, uh, I, I watched a, a, a lecture by uh, Dylan Bickerstaff once, uh, all talking uh, about the uh, legal proceedings that went on in the hiring conspiracy. Now, basically, one of the lesser wives decided that um, she wanted her son to be the next pharaoh, and he was young, and therefore she could be the regent, and wouldn't it be a really cool idea to bump off Ramses III and put her son on the throne? And she was helped by some uh, viziers and other courtiers, um, but they were found out. And um, the uh, papyrus goes into a lot of detail about what they did and who was doing what and who was involved in this conspiracy and everything like that. But it was, I think, again, we're talking about, we're, we're, this is getting to the end of the Egyptian empire. Can you think of anybody in their right mind having a go at Tutmosis the first? Um, you know, uh, doing a conspiracy against the builder of the pyramids. We are dealing with a very different Egypt now. People think that it's worth trying it. They don't have the same level of respect, uh, fear, etc. for Pharaoh that they used to have. They're, they're seeing him very much as a, a, an ordinary person. So the, the, the Egyptian empire is really um, not what it used to be. And Ramses III is really the last, um, although there's a lot of other Ramses in the 20th dynasty, they, they, they are very short-lived and, and short-reigned and, um, you know, quite weak rulers, young boys, old men, um, and it sort of all disintegrates. Now, this is the uh, first pylon of Ramses the. Third, you can see the um, niches for the flagpoles, uh, the windows up the top. Um, there are actually steps going up inside these pylons so that they could have had rituals at the top, probably sun connected, you know, maybe greeting the rising sun or saying goodbye to the setting sun or something like that. Now, uh, before we get to that part, we've got the gateway. Now, this is actually a little bit interesting because 
if you look in that window there, if you get in the right light, if you stand in that corner there and look up and you've got the light in the right place, you can see a picture of Pharaoh clucking under the chin of this young girl. Now, for some reason, um, the, the, this is Pharaoh's pleasure area. I find it strange to believe it's a gateway. But from the pictures in there, which are, you know, sensual kind of pictures, it would seem that the girls were up there. Um, and maybe this was the site of the Taurian conspiracy. And maybe this is where the women were, you know, discussing it. Um, this is the window up there. Um, I, it's there. It's, it's tricky to see, but I, I can see it because I'm an Egyptologist and I know what I'm looking for. But can you just see that hand there going under her chin? All right, trust me. <laughs> now, uh, Ramses the, the third, his uh, uh, this woman uh, was Tay. Uh, her son was called Pet Ewer, and uh, they were both tried. Uh, well, not, not the sun, but the vizier and so forth. Now, on the south wall, um, this is the scene of where you have the battles that he fought against the Libyans and the Sea Peoples. That Sea Peoples is a term that we, we're not really... It's not totally defined, but it, it, it's, it's a, a group of six or seven loosely um, allied people that came from the Mediterranean basin, and um, uh, they, they had shoot and run tactics, which you know uh, conventional armies found quite difficult to fight against. It's that the terrorist against the standing army, um, you know, you can pick off the standing army and and make their life hell and that's what the sea peoples did and of course they're coming on boats weren't they so they had managed to destroy the hittites egypt's traditional enemy um that's who Ankh-Salmon was written to for help um it, it was a, a defensive battle that ramses was fighting and um the the libnan um, were the, the people in the area of Libya, but the, the original people that were there weren't um, as aggressive as the new people that were coming in. And, and we, we don't know what had driven all these people. We suspect that it was an economic migration, that there was maybe some kind of harvest um, collapse or something like that because women and children were included. Um, so um, there was obviously something pushing these people and they were going towards the areas where they thought there might be a chance of getting to, um, a good life. And, and, and Egypt, you know, with its um, agriculture was very famous. Uh, it's the only sea battle depicted on a um, temple or, or tomb wall because, um, you know, m most of their battles were land battles. Now, this is the sea battle here. Um, and if you look here, do you see the prow of the boats there? Um, and uh, it's, again, it's showing chaos. Uh, and um, how Pharaoh will bring order to that chaos, because he's clever, isn't he? Um, and why we think it's an economic migration, do you see this ox cart? See the oxes here? And the wheel, and the little wicker thing? And look, there's a woman, and she, there's a child falling out the back, and she's hauling him back in. So women and children being included. Um, by the way, also notice two Coptic crosses here, um, that there was a, a church in this area uh, much, much later on, and, and this was part of the decoration of the church. Now, um, this is a view of the Temple Palace. You can see it's actually quite small. It's not big at all. Um, so, 
this isn't where Pharaoh lived. Where Pharaoh lived was on the east bank in a great big mud brick um, place which was constantly being grown and uh, it was easy to repair and so forth. Um, the temples were mansions for eternity, so were built of stone, but your palace was built on the east bank of mud brick and we don't have much evidence of living accommodation. Those priest houses that I talked about at Tarmac and the houses that I will talk about later at Dera Medina are the only examples that I'm aware of where we've actually got living accommodation. Now, um, from this palace, there's a set of stairs over here that leads to a window of appearances where Pharaoh would have um, stood up there all might and power and chucked out collars of gold and golden flies and said, well done, you've all done very well. Um, there's some little suites of rooms along here. Um, there's a, a, a sort of like a bedroom area. There's also a shower toilet area. Now, most of these suites of room are mud, but the shower toilet area is lined with stone. So this is to protect the mud from being washed away as people were pouring water over them. Um, so, <laughs> really clever. But it, it is quite small. So probably Pharaoh just came here overnight. There was a big uh, celebration going on the next day, or maybe he was just having lunch here or something like that. It was only just for him and a, a few cronies. It consists of um, an audience chamber, um, which has uh, got uh, a, a little platform with steps leading up to it. And um, either side of it, it's got a sort of... Uh, you know, hieroglyphic saying how wonderful uh, Pharaoh was. Um, and uh, I mentioned about the stone-lined bathrooms, and there's about five or six of these small suites of rooms. They're very small. Now, hunting in the marshes. Remember hunting in the marshes at the Tomb of Ai? Well, here's a legitimate royal hunting in the marshes. Um, this is at the back of the first pylon and you can see the bull being chased into the marshes. Um, you can see all these fish down here at the edge of the Nile. You've got some of Pharaoh's sons there who are helping him in the chase and there's Pharaoh. So here again we've got this concept of Pharaoh, mighty and powerful, able to bring down a bull and bringing order to the chaos. Um, the incised relief is so deep that pigeons can mess. I mean, I give Ramses II a hard time about his incised relief, but Ramses III seems to take it one step further. Oh my God, it is so deep. I, I can put my fist in some of these glyphs, and, and the whole depth of my fist it, it disappears into it. Unfortunately, these pigeons are doing a lot of damage to um, the release there. You can see the, the acidity of the, their waste droppings and the damage that it's doing there. Um, I, I wish the authorities would do something about that. My solution would be to have somebody with a nice tame hawk going around. That should get rid of them all quite eco-friendly. Um, you know, they'd all go and nest somewhere else if they knew there was a hawk flying around every couple of hours. Um, and that the tourists would love it. Now, this is the first courtyard, um, and you can see that the statues there, uh, aside statues, uh, king, crossed arms, um, normal stuff, but look at those ankles. I just don't understand it. There's something about Ramses III sculptors that they cannot do a decent ankle. Those are the chubbiest ankles I've ever seen. They look so gross, don't they? Um, he, I mean, in his tomb, he's not shown like that. So it's, he obviously has very poor sculptures. Now, um, you've also got in the first court this window of appearances. And um, uh, the decoration around it, um, he's got 
sort of like gargoyles of the heads of his enemies. So it actually appears he's trampling on the heads of his enemies. And underneath the window itself, there are scenes that um, they sort of look gladiatorial. Um, uh, whether they were uh, captives that were being made to fight against each other or demonstrating their power, I'm, I'm not quite sh sure, but it was a very off, uh, you know, very unusual scenes. Um, and either side of the window of appearance, you see Shun smiting enemies and looking very powerful and, you know, you're not going to argue with him. And it would put him at a great height to be able to shower gold down and things like that and everybody grovel around and say thank you very much. Now, the colonnades here are just absolutely spectacular. You can get a glimpse there of the colour going through. Um, and when you start looking at this colour here, you're just stunned. Um, in the second call, we have some battle scenes. And he is shown counting body parts. And when I say body parts, I mean penises. Um, there are three piles, two of hands and one of penises, and I don't know why. I mean, why would you cut the hands off one set of enemies and the penises off another? Could it be officers and men? I don't know. Um, but, interestingly enough, these penises are uncircumcised, and there was very much a... a Ancient Egyptian circumcised nice and clean, uh, dirty, horrible foreigner, uh, uncircumcised, um, and that, that's how you can tell the difference. On the other side, it's a bit more normal, we have um, the king making offerings to priests who are processing barks of the gods, Armin and Konsu. Um, they would start off on altars and then they are processed down. And the colour, the colour is spectacular. Look at this. I bet you're stunned, aren't you? But they were all like this. All the temples were like this. Really rich, gaudy, gaudy colours. It is just stunning, really beautiful. Now, unfortunately, the High Star Hall hasn't lasted quite as well as that at the Ramesseum. So, when we go on to the module to look at the Ramesseum, what I want you to remember is the first two courts here, and forget about the Ramesseum first two courts, and remember the uh, High Star Hall and sanctuaries at the Ramesseum, and put the two together in your mind, and then you've got a, a full temple. But here, unfortunately, um, we've lost a lot of the tops of the columns. Um, straight ahead of us, we have a mummy form god holding power, life and stability. And this is the god Ptah in one of the shrines going round. There's also an Osiris chapel as well. Um, so even with a temple dedicated to Amun and Khonsu, you will get other gods as well. Now, there are some particularly nice granite statues in the inner sanctuary. Now, remember, this should have been your smallest, darkest space, so it, it shouldn't have been shown like here. But um, do look at the head there. Now, do you remember what I said about moon crescents and full moons? So we have a moon crescent here, and we have an ibis-headed so this is Thoth, a moon god. Um, and you can see the, the other statues there, the carvings are very, very fine. And when you consider they only had copper tools, um, it's quite amazing what they managed to achieve. Now this is um, another uh, offshoot of this central area, which is a sun court. And... Um, now, sun courts um, are always open to the air, and when you look through that doorway and see the um, the altar there, 
um, you, you can see how the the sun would have actually been the thing that they were worshipping in there. So um, very nice on the uh, right hand side there. Now in the Osiris chapels we have some other unusual scenes. We've got Pharaoh um, ritually taking place taking part in agricultural scenes in order to improve the productivity of the agriculture. You know, um, if Pharaoh's doing the ploughing, we can rely on the fact we're going to get a good crop. Now, um, outside Ramses III, let's go to the 18th dynasty uh, temple, um, built by Hatshepsut completed by Thutmosis III, lot of Amarna damage. Now this is where Akhenaten came along and said, I don't like that god's name up there, I'm going to hammer it out. It was restored by uh, Ramses II. It has a very nice Ptolemaic gateway on it, and in the court in front is a Thutmosis false door. So here is the 18th dynasty temple. Um, you can see that there is a little bit of colour there on Thutmose's um, uh, crown. It's the, the nice blues and everything there. You can see it's got raised relief. Um, it's a very nice little temple. Now, you're not always going to get access here because Chicago House are working. Um, so a lot of the time it's closed off um, because they're uh, recording the inscriptions. Um, now, do you remember how I told you that Chicago House have a lot of their publications online? And there is a massive amount from Medine Habu online um, that you can look at, even though you can't get access to the temple. Now, this I actually took through a hole in the door because it is closed off, but you may be able to get lucky the same as me and poke your nose through the door and have a look at it. Where they've restored the sanctuary in there, and it's a very ruined statue, but they've restored a lot of that as well. So, um, very nice little um, uh, sort of sanctuary there. And this is the false door in the Roman court. Um, false doors to pharaohs, quite unusual. So, quite a special one, this one. Um, and um, very, very nicely carved in red granite. Blockyards, you know my blockyards. Have a look round the blockyards in Chicago House. Do be careful though, because there is work going on on restoration of the stone, and and sometimes the, the stone is actually being destroyed um, and eaten away by rising water. And, and they've got it carefully placed so that it doesn't contaminate other stone. It does spread like a virus, seriously. So, you know, always be careful not to touch things and stuff like that, but there's no harm in having a look. Well, that's the end of the fourth module, and the next one is the Temple of Merenpetar, and I hope you've enjoyed this one, and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you very much.